SJC 12502, Commonwealth v. Michelle Carter. Mr. Marks, good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Daniel Marks for the defendant, Michelle Carter. Michelle Carter is the first person ever in Massachusetts or anywhere else to be convicted of involuntary manslaughter for verbally encouraging another person to commit suicide, even though Michelle, who was 17 at the time, was not physically present when Conrad Roy took his own life and did not physically provide him with the means to do that. Counsel, do you see a difference between um, that and failing to call the police when knowing that somebody was in jeopardy? Uh, absolutely, Your Honor. I think your, your question gets to uh, one of the, the core problems in this case, which is the confusion about what kind of involuntary manslaughter case we're dealing with. Uh, the first time this court heard this case, it clearly conceived of this case as about coercion. It used that word over and over and over again in its opinion, referring to a systematic campaign of coercion that Michelle uh, engaged in against Conrad. That word, coercion, is conspicuously absent from the trial judge's explanation of his verdict. That was not the finding of the trial court, and it's not what the evidence at trial showed. The evidence at trial, to your point, Justice Cipher, showed that what Michelle was convicted of doing was creating or participating in the creation of a life-threatening circumstance and then failing to take action to save Conrad. There's a litany of things the trial judge says Michelle should have done. She should have called 911. She should have called his parents. Uh, she should have told him, get out of the truck. The problem with that theory of the case is twofold. First, there is no criminal liability for the failure to act in the absence of a legal duty. We have no good Samaritan law here, and there's no case law, none, none's been cited, that with words alone, someone can bring upon themselves the legal duty to prevent another person from hurting themselves. Well, Commonwealth versus Levesque is obviously not a words alone case, but the uh, duty to report a fire that you may have started, what about that? Well, so Levesque, uh, Catalina, uh, Walansky, all of these cases involve some physical conduct, whether it's kicking over a candle, giving someone heroin, uh, uh, operating a nightclub, uh, they certainly involve speech, and the failure to report the fire in Levesque uh, is speech or non-speech, but none of those cases, and again, this is a, it's both a sufficiency problem and a due process problem. None of those cases involve a situation where words alone created a duty sufficiently strong under the common law of Massachusetts to hold someone criminally liable for involuntary manslaughter. And not only is that a sufficiency problem, but it means there's no way Michelle Carter, 17-year-old Michelle Carter, could have known that with her words, she could have brought that duty upon herself. But to get back to your, your question, Justice Cipher, about calling 911, the, real, the, the biggest problem uh, with that aspect of the Commonwealth's case is they just missed putting in any evidence on causation. So the theory of the case is Conrad gets back into his truck at some point, it's filling with carbon monoxide, and what Michelle should have done is call 911. There are two problems. There's no evidence, there was none at trial, that she knew where he was parked. There's a single text message. There's, from, evidence, there's evidence they were talking for a significantly long period of time, correct? Correct, and that he was in a car uh, which was in the general area of that Kmart parking lot. There's no evidence the car was stopped where he was or that he told her where he was. The only evidence the Commonwealth points to on appeal is a text sent more than a week after Conrad died on the 20th of July in which Michelle claims to a friend, I knew he was at the Kmart parking lot. Well, the, see, I think the problem you've got is that you ignore the Lattimore standard because you, throughout your brief and you, you keep arguing, well, the only evidence was, and that evidence wasn't all that good. That's not Lattimore. So why don't you deal with the facts you have under a Lattimore standard? And stop saying the only evidence is. Well, I believe the Lattimore standard requires sufficient evidence for a rational jury to conclude there is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Lattimore doesn't relieve the Commonwealth of that obligation. It allows the this light most favorable to the government, correct? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. There is no contemporaneous evidence that Michelle knew where Conrad was parked. By the time she tells her friend, I knew about the Kmart parking lot. Well, why does it have to be contemporaneous, though? I mean, evidence is evidence, right? The, 
I mean, that, that text you don't like that's a week late is still important evidence. It's from her mouth. It's from her fingers, her, right? It's her text. Exactly, Your Honor. And, and the text I really don't like isn't from a week later. It's from two months later. Okay, the only text in which Michelle ever says, I told Conrad to get back in the truck, is two months after the night that he died. But again, now, but, but that's evidence, right? I mean, it's still important evidence, yes. right? Okay. Yes, but yeah. Michelle's conviction under both federal and state law cannot be affirmed on the basis of that text, absent some independent corroboration. That's Ford. That's the corroboration rule. Well, wait, wait, wait. The, the corroboration rule is, is a little less than that, isn't it? I mean, Ford's telling us basically there has to be evidence of a crime, not or evidence of an event, at least, a body, or in, in a case of a confession, something that corroborates in that regard that something that's being told is not complete. Right. Ford talks about the corpus delicti, which right. makes sense in the facts of that case. You're talking about someone who comes into the police station and says, I killed my wife. Now the question is, if there's a body, that corroborates that confession. Here, the presence of Conrad's body sheds no light whatsoever on Let whether me ask it's a suicide a different or question. homicide. Let me ask you a different question. You've been discussing the absent, the, the, you're saying there's, it, there was not sufficient evidence of uh, sur surrounding the circumstances of her duty or failure to call. Do you agree that if there were sufficient evidence that that would be a viable theory for a conviction? If she had a duty? If, yes. If, no, if, if, if there was sufficient evidence on this case, because you're arguing there wasn't, or are you arguing that there's legally no duty regardless of how strong the evidence is? Or both. I'm arguing both, Your Honor, but I think your second point was even if there were a duty here, I think the bigger problem with the Commonwealth's case is that there's no evidence, none, about what would have happened had Michelle called 911. And on appeal- Okay, so stop you one more time. You're saying even if there was a duty, there's still no evidence. Now, if there was a duty and there was evidence, is that enough? If, if a person under Wolanski, if a are, person are has a duty. Admitting to the, that theory. And the reckless, absolutely, I'm not arguing Wolanski, Wolanski's okay. bad law, you're, no, absolutely not. If a, under Massachusetts law, if a person has a duty, uh, one they brought upon themselves uh, through their own conduct, uh, and that duty requires them to take steps to prevent harm to another person, and they recklessly and wantlessly fail to do that, that can be involuntary manslaughter under Massachusetts law. But and that's it, not what happened here. And it doesn't need to just be the 911 call, right? The judge says she had this profound, she could have made the profound statement, get out of the truck, right? That would have been enough. That's right. First of all, we have no idea what was said on those phone calls. So there are text messages, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of text messages up to the afternoon of July 12th. Then there's this period where there's two phone calls, an hour and a half where we have no window into what actually happened, what Conrad really did or what Michelle may have said. And as far as her telling him, well, what would have happened if she said, get out of the truck? It's complete speculation. It doesn't satisfy the Lattimore standard. There's no evidence in the record and no way for a rational jury to conclude there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Conrad Roy would have listened to Michelle Carter after his lengthy history of rejecting numerous suggestions she made, big and small, like go get psychiatric treatment or why don't you meet me for a date. She wanted to be his girlfriend and he was dating other people. This is not a woman who had control over a younger, more vulnerable victim. But beyond that, there's no evidence that he even could have gotten out of the truck at certainly, that point. He's certainly a more vulnerable victim, right? I disagree, Your Honor. I think this is a tragic case. These are two she, vulnerable. She, but she knows he's suicidal, right? Um, and he's made suicide attempts in the past. Isn't he, can't we assume she knows he's absolutely vulnerable? I don't think so, Your Honor. And th that gets into the issue about uh, whether or not Judge Munoz should have applied a reasonable juvenile standard. I think if you look at this case from the perspective of a 17-year-old kid who's just come out of inpatient treatment herself, who's struggling with her own mental health issues, who knows he has a long history of psychiatric problems and suicide attempts, she says in text uh, proximate to this event, things like, I thought if I went along with him, he'd realize this was a mistake or I'd hoped to precipitate a crisis which would cause his family to finally get him into treatment. Uh, there's no evidence that suggests she thought what she was doing was pushing him into actually killing himself. In fact, what she says repeatedly to her friends, starting within 24 hours of this event, is I never thought he'd actually do it. When you say no evidence, that's dismissing the statement to Ms. Boardman uh, much later 
uh, and you're relying on the confession rule for that. So it becomes pretty important to see whether or not there's any corroboration. It's just a cipher reference. Not much corroboration is necessary. They're on the phone for 90 minutes. Um, she, he's where she said he would be. Uh, you've got text messages that corroborate. And um, it's consistent with previous text messages where there was this constant pressure in the light most favorable to the Commonwealth, recognizing that the inferences don't have to be inevitable or satisfy individually, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, although they all do together. I don't disagree, Your Honor. There's plenty of corroboration in this case. For the statement, so for the statement. Wrong. No, I disagree with that, Your Honor. And the crux of this case, of the Commonwealth's case, where it started in its opening and where it started in its closing, is this claim, oft repeated, that she told him, get back in the truck. None of the facts Your Honor's identified and none of the facts that the trial judge identified corroborate that moment. But we know there's a water pump in the truck. We know the truck is at Kmart. We know that he committed suicide. But none of that tells us whether or not he ever got out of his truck and she ever told him to get back in. She told us that through her text messages. So exactly, Your Honor. And that's the problem with this case is the only evidence of that. And I, Your Honor, I respectfully say it doesn't even pass the Lattimore standard. The only evidence is a text sent two months later. And we, we replicated the entire text in our brief to give the court, make it clear this is a long, rambling text to a friend in which there's a single phrase, I said, get back in. Her conviction cannot be affirmed on the basis of that evidence alone. It's contradicted by more contemporaneous evidence, like her frantic calls to Conrad the night when he died, her text to him saying, I'm worried, her email to his little sister, who at her mother's uh, direction lied to Conrad and said, he uh, lied to Michelle and said, Conrad's fine and asleep but, at his dad's are, house. But this is what fact finders do. They get contradictory evidence and they decide what facts are credible and they make decisions. Well, it, respectfully, Your Honor, the court yesterday issued an opinion which said that that's not quite what we're doing here, right? So this is a case, a bizarre case, where there's no direct evidence of what was said on these critical two phone calls. No direct evidence of whether these kids were even on the phone when Conrad died. And yesterday, the court issued an opinion saying, when the bulk of the evidence in a case are documents that this court can read just as well as any other, that's not a credibility determination. We can all read these text messages. We can all see how complex the relationship between these two troubled teenagers were. And we can all see from the text messages Michelle Carter did not force Conrad Roy to kill himself. That was a, a tragic decision that the, he made. Can I there ask a question that has nothing to do with sufficiency? I want, we only have about two and a half minutes left, and I'd like you to address the First Amendment issue. Sure. And I ask you in particular whether you think that there's more protection under the state constitution than under the federal. Um, I think there's certainly a strong argument that there is more protection, although I think Michelle's speech would be protected under either body of law. All right, would you speak to that, please? Sure. Um, there are uh, a handful of well-defined, uh, clearly defined, narrow categories of speech that fall outside the First Amendment. Uh, this isn't one of them. The Commonwealth has never argued it falls into one of those categories. What the Commonwealth has done is to identify a compelling state interest at stake, specifically the state's interest in preventing speech with a direct causal connection to a suicide. Now, the problem with that analysis is that's just the beginning of the constitutional test. Once you've identified a compelling state interest, then you have to ask, is the regulation of protected speech narrowly tailored to serve that interest? The Commonwealth doesn't even argue, and it's hard to imagine how it could, that the common law of involuntary manslaughter, which, by the way, could prohibit and would subject someone to prosecution, uh, a person who gave advice in the ALS hypothetical this court wrestled with the last time it heard this case, uh, there, there's no way that the, the common law of involuntary manslaughter is narrowly tailored to prevent uh, only certain types of speech uh, that, that can be prohibited. It, it's simply not. In fact, there's never been a case where this court's even wrestled with how to apply that body of law to an assisted or encouraged suicide. The way, and that's why, Your Honor, that's why almost every other state in this country, 45 states, have passed laws, assisted suicide laws. Cases like this raise incredibly complicated moral and legal how questions. About, how about the wanton requirement? Does that? If we're analyzing assisted suicide, here we ha you have to prove it's wanton, right? Immoral, uh, I'm a, you can put your definition to wanton. Does that provide a way of distinguishing this from the person who is counseling someone with ALS uh, to, 
you know, combine their medicine in a way that leads to death? You know, I, I think it's, it's a plausible argument, although I'm sure people disagree violently about the ALS hypothetical and whether that's appropriate or not. My question is, does the wanton requirement allow you to distinguish this situation from that one? I don't think so, Your Honor. And I don't think there's any basis in the law to, to use that word as a way to distinguish this. Remember, due process requires there be clear guidance for prosecutors about which cases are illegal and which cases are legal. There is no such guidance in Massachusetts law. This court recognized it was unable to draw those lines. That's why this should be an issue for the legislature, not for the court to pass a statute. And by the way, but that, under that, the that's, statute- that's, that's not true. I mean, in the, in the decision that we issued about this case, Justice Corey wrote that in sum, we conclude that there was probable cause to show that the coercive quality of the defendant's verbal conduct overwhelmed whatever willpower the 18-year-old victim had to cope with his depression, and that but for the defendant's admonishments, pressure, and instructions, the victim would not have gotten back into the truck and poisoned himself to death. Uh, that's the guidance that we gave as to what distinguishes this, these words from somebody who was helping somebody who has made a decision to commit suicide to do so. Uh, so, uh, now I know the judge did not use the word coercion, but the judge in this case made findings that said, I don't find causation until the moment essentially in which he found she's told him to get back into the truck. Uh, is that not in keeping I know we didn't use the word co coercion, but should we not understand that to be a causation finding in keeping with this concept of overcoming the whatever willpower power this particular vulnerable victim had and therefore essentially not merely assisting him to commit suicide, but overwhelming his desire to get cold feet and not commit suicide? No, Your Honor. Uh, it's a causation finding, but that's very different and needs to be distinguished from a coercion finding. Now, it could be that what Carter I did was to establish as a matter of common law that in situations of clear coercion, there may be liability. Of course, Carter I just said that grand jury had probable cause uh, to indict uh, for involuntary manslaughter, didn't find beyond a reasonable doubt that there was, in fact, coercion here. And the judge doesn't point to any coercion associated with the supposed get back in statement. L let's take Michelle's text in September for what it's worth. She doesn't say she coerced him into getting back into the truck. There's no indication in her text that she forced him to do that. She uses words in later texts to friends like, I eased him into it. That's the opposite of coercion. But you can't look at that text in a vacuum. You have to look at it in the context of the entire relationship. Absolutely, Your Honor, and I think the entire relationship shows a very complex picture of a young girl with many of her own challenges who is struggling to help out a boy she considered to be her boyfriend. Now, in retrospect, it may have been a mistake going along with him and hoping he'd see what he was doing was stupid may have been a poor choice, but it was not involuntary manslaughter. Let me just say one other thing. I know, I know I'm... Yeah, but you, I'm, we'll let you say the last thing, but... Uh... <clears throat> There's a tension here between your argument with regard to sufficiency, which goes to the interpretation of her words, quote, I was on the phone with him and he got out of the car because it was working and he got scared and I fucking told him to get back in. I mean, that's ultimately the gist of this case. Uh, we found there was probable cause based on that statement to indicate that she had overcome his willpower at that point because he had chosen to get out of the car and she had told him to get back in. The judge uh, found that that was the essence of his causation distinction because he found that all that had happened before did not cause him to go in. Uh, what do we do with that? Are you, I mean, I, 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 I know that you're saying that statement is not enough alone, but I think our jurisprudence with regard to the corroboration of confessions is probably contrary to your argument. So how do you win in a situation in which the judge interpreted that statement in the context of the trial to indicate that that was what caused him to go back in the car uh, and our statement with regard to the first opinion in this case? So here's how I read 
the way the judge read that text. And I don't think there's really a, a, another fair way to read it. The systematic campaign of coercion that this court talked about, which started possibly in early July, maybe even before that, never occurred. There was no proof beyond a reasonable doubt that there was such a campaign and that Michelle drove this process, designed the suicide plan, and, and caused Conrad to end up in that parking lot with a water pump in his own truck by himself. What the judge found is that there was a chain of self-causation up until that moment. Now, when let's take, let's assume, uh, in the absence of evidence other than her own uncorroborated confession, that he got out of the truck and then she told him to get back in. I understand Judge Moniz to be saying what that does legally is puts us in the Wolanski category. What she's now done by saying, get back in the truck, knowing, as he refers to it, as the toxic environment inside the truck, she's exposed him now to a life-threatening risk, bringing upon herself a duty to do something about it, which is why the very next thing the judge says is, she could have called the police, she could have called the family, she could have told him to get out. So at that point, I think the only way to read it is we're not talking about coercion. What we're talking about is the participation in an activity which exposed Conrad to a life-threatening risk and created a duty for Michelle. The reason why the Commonwealth's case unravels under that theory is there's no evidence that, first of all, legally, she had a duty to do anything, but separately, that had she called the police, he would have lived. Or had she said to him, get out of the truck, he would have listened to her, notwithstanding the fact he was more than happy to reject all sorts of suggestions she made. There's no evidence in this record. This is just like Pew. And I know they want to say, well, childbirth is complicated, but somehow carbon monoxide poisoning isn't. But I don't think we can take judicial notice that had Conrad unrolled the window or stepped out of the car, he would have survived. There isn't even evidence in the record that he was still conscious at that point. Once he gets back in the truck, as she calls 911, the only testimony in the record, which is completely generalized and abstract, is from the ME who says, you become dizzy, disoriented, non-responsive, unconscious. We have no idea when any of those things happened. We have no idea what would have happened had she called 911. The Commonwealth never even asked a witness what would have happened? What would 911 have done? What's the medical treatment in this situation? What's the prospect for Conrad's survival given his, his uh, carbon monoxide levels at that point? So the way I read what the judge decided in this case is the chain of self-causation is broken at the moment he steps out of the car. She instructs him, not coerces him, to get back in. Uh, and at that point, she has a duty to do something about it, and she didn't. And the judge convicted her on that basis. And, and are you suggesting that had she um, done that, had she instructed him to get out of the car, but yet it was too late and he, he passed away anyway, that that would have, uh, she would still be in the same position now, or would she be... Not guilty because she'd be, they're... No, she'd be not guilty, Your Honor. I mean, in the absence of causation evidence, mm -hmm. in the absence of proof that doing something to fulfill that duty could have saved him, there's no causation. So it didn't, doesn't matter whether it could have saved him or not. If she had done that. Oh, no, no. That, oh, it does matter. That, that's the whole question, Your Honor. Is yeah, right. What doesn't matter is whether we're talking about calling 911 or saying get out of the truck. But, it's got to matter. <laughs> it has to save his life to have done something. And yeah. in the absence of evidence she could have saved him, there's no causation in this case for a finding of manslaughter. And it's, it's your argument that the, the judge could not have drawn a reasonable inference that had she called 911 and the responders, and, and, and if you look at the statement in the text in the light most favorable of the Commonwealth, she had the, 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 the parking lot location, that the emergency responders wouldn't have opened the door and saved her, saved him. I think you the think only evidence You think that's too much of a stretch? Yes. Only to the point where you get to, do I think it's reasonable to infer she could have called 911 and they probably could have got to the parking lot right. uh, quickly? Yes, I think that's a reasonable inference. The problem is there's no evidence of what they would have done and whether simply getting him out of the truck would have saved his life, whether he could be saved at that point. That's the problem the court wrestled with in Pew, is you have a breached childbirth and there's no evidence about had 911 been called and rushed to this woman's aid that the baby would have survived. We don't know. We're guessing. That's a failure proof in the Commonwealth's case. Absolutely, Your Honor. On the coercion point that the chief raised earlier, don't we look at the, the earlier texts and the relationship and that she's his primary sort of collaborator in these suicide discussions? Isn't that really important in determining whether she has some kind of power over him or um, influence over him that kicks in in this analysis? I think it's important. Uh, this is something they talked about extensively. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I would say a fair reading of the text is that he not only started the conversation years earlier after his first failed suicide attempt when he told her, I just tried to kill myself and I'm gonna succeed next time. He started this chain of conversation with her and he pushed it. He, oh, it who he, starts it doesn't really matter if right. she has a coercive that's right. um, power over right. him. To, to borrow uh, uh, Attorney Stern's phrase from, from the Carter One argument, what matters is who's driving. The texts leave only one conclusion here, only one rational conclusion based on the evidence, which is Conrad was driving. Michelle did not push him and coerce him into taking his own life. This court, respectfully, identifies as the one fact that shows that she had some hand in, in putting this fatal plan together, that at one point she said, Google ways to make carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. That can't be enough for a teenager to say to another teenager by text, Google a way to kill yourself, somehow makes her responsible for a plan that he's, he's concocted well, but and put you, into effect? If you combine Google how to kill yourself with then go back into the car, um, yeah, that's collabor corroboration, isn't it, of the other point? I mean, you've got multiple times where she says, just do it, right? Right. Get it over with. Right. Mm -hmm. The problem is none of those tell us whether once he gets in the car, when he gets to the Kmart parking lot, he ever gets out. Not, except for her words, months later, in this rambling text message, none of that other evidence, it just corroborates he, he committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning, not that specific critical detail of whether he ever got out and she somehow caused him well, to get no, back no, in. No piece of evidence in a vacuum uh, uh, proves anything. Uh, as, as Justice Kafka was alluding to, we have to take uh, the entire relationship. It's almost uh, analogous with um, the defendant's understanding to uh, an eggshell skull situation, mm -hmm. and that um, she understands who she's been dealing with because she's been talking about this with him for quite a long time. So it, it's a good point, Your Honor, and I think this gets to a fundamental misunderstanding of uh, suicide attempts and completed suicide. Uh, the Commonwealth sort of invokes, without saying it specifically, that somehow the corroboration here is that this is all consistent with the habits of these two kids. She's curious, so certainly she must have been curious about the details of his suicide, they speculate. He has tried before and failed, so he must have tried and got nervous and backed out again, they speculate. That's not how suicide works. We cite a major observational study of thousands of suicide attempts, and by the way, there's no evidence in the record about this from the Commonwealth. The only testimony about it is from Dr. Bregan, the one expert who testified who said, the greatest predictor of a suicide is a prior suicide attempt. Suicide attempts are not a stable habit. They do not predict that someone will try and fail to commit suicide over and over and over again. They're a progression. And here, as could have been predicted and was by some of his treaters, this was a tragic, uh, 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 trajectory that Conrad Roy was on that ultimately ended up in his successful suicide. A successful suicide he predicted two years earlier when he first said to Michelle, I tried to kill myself and I'm gonna succeed next time. So the notion that, well, based on the, the way they reacted and what he did in the past, he would have backed out again, we can be sure he would have got out of his truck, that's a, that's, there's no basis in that. And, it, and it's completely contrary to what public health science knows about people who commit suicide. Uh, you said you had one more argument, and I promised I wouldn't let you do it. Do Thank you, Your Honor. You, I will take that invitation. Do you recall what it is? I do, and, okay. and I'll be. Uh, <laughs> I do, and I'll be. I'll be very brief about it. <laughs> one thing we haven't touched on uh, is Michelle Carter's involuntary manslaughter conviction cannot be affirmed unless this court also affirms the finding that she was a youthful offender. The court can only make that decision if it defines the word inflict. It hasn't done that. The final footnote in Carter 1 did say, for the purposes of probable cause in an indictment, that we'll assume an involuntary manslaughter uh, uh, offense involves the infliction of physical harm, but as we've cited in our briefs, and there's no contrary authority, no other definition's been offered, infliction is a statutory term that means something very specific. It means the direct application of physical harm. It cannot be done by text message, it cannot be done from 50 miles away, and it was not done in this case. So essentially you're arguing there's a, a, a very strong difference between giving somebody a push off of a cliff and a text message that encourages them to jump, is that right? Absolutely, Your Honor. Does it go so far as to say if somebody directs somebody else to push somebody off the cliff that that, that person does not inflict the harm because all he did was tell somebody else to do it? 
Well, so again, depending on how this court comes out on the involuntary manslaughter, the, the recommender, the speaker in that hypothetical, Your Honor, may be liable for involuntary manslaughter, but not as a youthful offender. That person hasn't inflicted harm on another person. Infliction means, the definition, strike a blow. We but, cite- But that's sort of a problem because we have gangs and we have gang leaders and gang leaders tell people who are their soldiers to do pretty horrendous violent things. And you're saying then that the leader of the gang merely because he gave instructions to do a hit or to do a shooting does not inflict harm because all he said was kill somebody or shoot somebody? But Your Honor, that, that's not how we do statutory interpretation. This isn't a policy question. We have a statute which uses a specific word which is not causation, it's infliction. The legislature picked that word. It may have been a mistake. Maybe they should reconsider and revise the youthful offender statute to capture more kids, but they chose the word inflict. We have to start our interpretation process by asking what's the definition of that word. The definition means a direct physical application of harm. There's no case, none, anywhere in this country, federal or state, or any dictionary I could find that doesn't agree, infliction means something narrower and more specific than causation. So you would say that one cannot inflict uh, emotional distress through bullying through words, is that right? Um, the emotional distress possibly can be inflicted that way, but the bodily physical harm must be inflicted by force, the application of force. That's what, how it's been interpreted everywhere. And the Commonwealth doesn't cite a case or, or a, a dictionary that says, oh no, infliction, that's just a fancy way of saying causation. It's not. It means something specific. And yes, Your Honor, it does narrow the reach of, of the youthful offender provision. How about murder for hire? What about that situation? Well, that's a separate crime, Your Honor. I mean, that's solicitation of murder. That's, that's no, made illegal by statute. I understand, but as it relates to uh, infliction. Right. Uh, so again, I'm not sure this has ever been dealt with, but I, I don't think uh, you could inflict uh, murder on someone by talking to another person. Well, suppose so, I, I hire you, right. I pay you $3,000 to push, push Justice Kafka off a cliff, right? <laughs> I wouldn't take that off. I know you wouldn't, <laughs> but hypothetically, yeah. right? And um, under the youthful offender statute, that I would not have inflicted if I were 17 or 16? That's right, Your Honor. I would not have inflicted that death on him. Uh, if all I did was, well, um, look, I, I don't think we need to get that far in this case, okay? Let, let me back up a second. I don't want to get crazy here with the, with the answer. I don't think we need to get that far. There may be situations, agency situations, uh, murder for hire situations, payment is maybe some kind of uh, physical involvement in the act. You know, I, I don't know where the line is, but I know this. Infliction means something. It's in a statute. This court is obliged to apply its ordinary definition, and that ordinary definition is to physically apply force and cause bodily harm. That didn't happen here. And by the way, as, as I know this court knows, and, and we cited a, an opinion that uh, Your Honor Justice Cipher wrote on, on the appeals court, the, the analysis in, in footnote 19, by the way, the categorical analysis is, is problematic, and I think inconsistent with Clint C. and a long line of cases from this court which says, we look at the actual conduct. When deciding whether kids can be treated as youthful offenders, stripped of juvenile protections and subjected to adult punishments, we look at their actual conduct, not the elements of the offense. So for the purposes of probable cause, I think Carter One decided fairly that involuntary manslaughter, if you have that, you can go to trial as a youthful offender. But when you're done, to affirm that conviction and to affirm the conviction of someone for involuntary manslaughter as a youthful offender, there must be proof beyond a reasonable doubt based on that defendant's actual conduct that she inflicted bodily harm on the victim. And infliction means something in that statute, and that's a standard that was not met in this case. And absent an affirmance, absent a definition of infliction which reaches all forms of causation, no matter how attenuated, uh, you cannot affirm the conviction of Michelle Carter. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Ms. Stern, good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Shoshana Stern for the Commonwealth, and with me is Assistant District Attorney Mary Claire Flynn. Um, Your Honor, this is a case in which the trial judge noted that he was not required to make any findings, but he felt that they were warranted, but that they were not comprehensive and should not be interpreted as his full analysis of the facts or the law or anything else. 
Um, and as we argue in our brief, he made findings that were, at his analysis of the law is substantially congruent with this court's decision in Carter, and I would suggest there's no reason to conclude that he reached a fundamentally different conclusion that would take him outside of the reach of the analysis of what, Carter What do you one. say to your brother's argument that uh, we, we can look at the documentary evidence as easily as, the, as he could? Is there, what other evidence is there in the trial other than the documentary evidence that he would have relied on? Well, there's, I mean, there is testimony. I agree that the documentary evidence does indeed need to be looked at, um, particularly because it is very intricate that so much of this case does by its nature, as this court noted in Carter one, these are always very fact-specific analyses of foreseeability. And so it really comes down to the relationship between these two people at that time. And I think there's really no way around looking at the voluminous record and in order to determine that in fact the evidence was sufficient. Um, and I think that that record would show that, you know, would support the judge's finding that there were 12 days of wanton and reckless conduct that did not have a direct causal relationship to the death leading up to it. And that one could interpret it as the relationship between the two of them shifting distinctly over that time in terms of the balance of power. Certainly over the two years they knew each other, he did not always, but, you know, Conrad even said, I believe, within the previous month, I don't like people telling me what to do in response to one of her comments. But within the subsequent weeks, he was saying he couldn't remember anything. He gave her a giant text about his philosophy of life and then said he didn't remember it a week or two later. And you know, I can't think straight. You need to help me. I need to trust you. You're going to find a way for me to do this. And it's not a complete continuum. Counsel, just in terms of chronology, could you remind me when she was at uh, McLean's? She was at McLean between, in early June. Um, she this happened in? This happened on July. 12th. So this is the, the time when she was in McLean's was when the balance of power shifted? No. Um, at, over at the, around the beginning of June, they start talking. They're sort of the, the, the central core of texts um, begin around then. He's starting to get depressed. He goes to stay with a college friend, and he's planning on going to college in the same place, and he feels social anxiety, and he comes home. And he, he says later, you know, two months ago, at, close to the time of his death, he says, two months ago, I felt fine. I don't know what the problem is. Um, she checks into McLean around that time, suggests he should come with her, says, you know, or go afterwards, says, I'll visit you, et cetera. Well, while she's at McLean's, is she texting him? She doesn't have her phone for most of that time. And how long is that? She, how, was, how long was she an inpatient? Um, about a week, week and a half. I think she checks. She, she, it's not clear if she leaves because it's an insurance issue where she says, you know, I was hoping I'd lose weight and I didn't. There's, she gets her phone back at some point. They talk. It's clear he's more depressed, but for a while he suggests that, you know, uh, for a few days that, you know, I know I'd never do anything. I'm not. She, she's saying, you know, I worry about you. I worry that you're suicidal, et cetera. At a certain point, he says, um, yeah, actually, I'm thinking about this all the time now. It's getting worse. When does the balance of power shift in terms of the chronology? Um, well, I think, it, I think it is a continuum. I don't know at what point you could say, you know, because of the but-for causation element, I don't know that there's a single point at which you could say, you know, that that's the moment other than the final moment. But I think that you see much more of, you know, first she starts out where, you know, it could very well be interpreted as, you know, this is what he wants, I'm just going to be supportive. And then the night of um, July 3rd, she thinks he's killing himself. Um, he takes sleeping pills and falls asleep. The next morning, she starts texting him, you know, I didn't mean it, please, this is not how you say goodbye to me. The next morning, she, he's alive and she is furious and says, you know, I feel played, like I thought you were serious. I don't believe you that you really mean it. You're going to have to prove it to me. And he says, I'll prove it to you. And over the next step, you know, she, she gets more sort of aggressive with her sort of, you know, you made this decision and I can't handle how long this is essentially taking. Um, the, um, We're not going to find in the, um, uh, in the written documents, are we, uh, any, anything to deal with the Pew issue in terms of causation? That would um, come from testimony from somebody, is that right? I don't think there's anything beyond the, um, the expert, general expert testimony about the effects of carbon monoxide. Okay. So, um, but... If I, if, if I can go back to where you started, mm -hmm. uh, the judge was under no obligation to make any findings. No. He could, he could have just said guilty. Yes. If he had said guilty, we'd be reviewing it for the sufficiency of the evidence. Yes. Uh, and we'd probably be applying the standard that we mm -hmm. did, which focused on overwhelming willpower. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the judge did make findings, which as you noted, he said, should not be said to be everything I would find if I mm -hmm. had to find them. Uh, but what do we do with them now? How do we examine his findings in view of the fact that they're not, they're not comprehensive? He doesn't specifically use the language that we used in our decision with regard to the overwhelming the willpower. He doesn't use the word coercion. How, how do we understand his findings in view of what we said was the that which distinguished this case from an, a, a more typical assisting suicide case? Well, again, I think that um, there's, to some extent, there is a de novo review of the evidence if it supports it. Um, I think that where he didn't make findings specifically, it's presumably a straight, you know, we don't know what he thought analysis, but you would review it as you would review other things. Um, I think it's instructive, of, you know, generally the um, sort of amount of consideration and, you know, there are certain things he didn't find that he could have, but, um, you know, that he, I think that, I mean, he doesn't use coercion, but he, he says essentially that 12 days of wanton and reckless conduct that was very serious did not have the direct causation. The final statement did, which suggests that it had more power than those other statements. Um, he implicitly, I think, necessarily finds that, she, and I think this is somewhat further supported by his sentencing findings, but um, that she, she's the but-for cause of his being in the truck, which again, I mean, she, if, if it's just a sort of, you know, well, I really think you should get back in, that's sort of, for causation is a fairly tight nexus, and he was clearly implying a very sort of thoughtful, careful view of it. Um, so what prong of wanton and reckless do we use then? What, which theory mm -hmm. are we operating on now? In terms of what's, what's, do, uh, what's, neglect of duty versus, right. I mean, I, I think he found both, and I think he necessarily, um, I mean, he, he discussed the more novel neglect of duty theory at greater length, but for one thing, unless she put him in the truck, she didn't have a duty to get him out. So I think necessarily he found that she was the operative cause of his being in the truck and not his own willpower at that point. The, uh, the uh, defendant interprets Carter one for the proposition that uh, the, um, the grand jury did not um, indict the defendant on a failure to act. W what do you think of that? I disagree. Um, I think that the grand jury issued a general indictment. It was actually broader. I mean, in, in Levesque, I believe, the indictment said did assault and beat, and this court said that that was sufficient to charge failure to act um, based on the evidence. And they, they had the text that said, you know, I could have gotten him out and I didn't, however one takes that. So they, they had before them facts that would support an indictment on both theories. And I don't think there's anything ever been notwithstanding this court statement in Carter one, I don't think there's ever been anything suggesting that, um, that it was an exclusive indictment in any way. I'm still, I'm still uh, having trouble understanding where we go with your answer to the Chief Justice's mm -hmm. question, because it's pretty complicated what we do here mm -hmm. um, along those lines. Um, as the Chief said, the judge could have said nothing, but, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, he said, well, what I'm saying, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, what I'm saying uh, is not my entire deliberative process mm -hmm. uh, on the facts or the law. Mm -hmm. So, but but he gives us a roadmap as to what he's thinking, and so I I, I have yeah. to agree. Uh, I don't know where we are with that. I mean, I think that to some extent that's just a sort of difficult sort of <laughs> presentation that just has to be unpacked. But I think I mean I think anything he finds didn't happen unless it was clearly a wrong. I mean, I think that anything he doesn't address at all continues to be open. I think that anything consistent with, um, I mean, it's a question that's not easily answered just because of the practical difficulties, but I don't know that it's sort of a deep, you know, but it's a your, practical question. Is your argument that his finding about causation is necessarily the finding about coercion that we've required in Carter One? Yes. Okay. Because, first of all, because it's required in Carter One, and he didn't argue he didn't find it, and he showed he was familiar with, the, he stated specifically, you know, I've re that he had reviewed all of this. He was clearly very careful that there's no reason to infer that he made a finding that was consistent with, but actually outside the scope of Carter One. So Can I'm really puzzled how we read these findings. <clears throat> I mean, do we defer to them? 
Excuse me, sorry. Do, do we defer to these findings? Um, or because, I mean, uh, they're mostly based on uh, texts and such that we can read ourselves. Suppose we come to a different I, I view of things. Uh, suppose we don't look at it the same way the judge did. Suppose we wouldn't make those findings. Would we I, defer to them? I believe, given the documentary nature, it would have to be de novo review in that case, unless it is tied in some way to particular evidence that he heard. Yeah, yeah. And again, I think that gets blurry around the edges, but that's a practical issue that just arises in any case on that situation. Well, I guess my question, too, is in reading it, do we have to somehow uh, superimpose a filter of uh, the uh, light most favorable to the Commonwealth or, or not? Or is it just totally de novo? I, I'm just very puzzled by this. Well, I think if it's sufficiency, it has to be light most favorable to the Commonwealth. I mean, I don't think that this... I think that the question has to be was sufficient evidence presented at trial, not a de novo review of is, he guilt, is she guilty? I mean, I think otherwise there's no point in having a trial and documentary evidence at all. It should go straight to this court. But, um, okay. but the question is does the evidence support the ultimate verdict would be the question. Now, the other, the other issue with regard to the judge's findings is you can assume that we knew, knew about Levesque mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that we mm -hmm. characterize this as not a failure to warn case suggest that's not how we understood it and the, and the probable cause finding that we focused mm -hmm. on was focused essentially on her direction mm -hmm. for him to get back in, not for her failure mm -hmm. to act after she did that. Uh, Mr. Mark says, well, actually what the judge found was that the failure to act was interwoven with her conduct and that we can't, it's not as if there were two independent causes that she's guilty because she told him to get back in and she's also separately guilty because she failed to call 911. Uh, do we view it as a interwoven finding of a failure to warn or do we view it as two separate and independent and sufficient findings, any one of which would be sufficient? I think it would be two independent and sufficient findings. I think that that is if you look carefully the judge's intent. He was clearly very interested in the neglect of duty theory, but he also, he, he, said, it, he said it was both. He reiterated this in the sentencing findings, both get, telling her, him to get in the truck and not telling him to get back out. I think in some ways it's a necessary finding, again, that she only creates the danger if she's the proximate cause of his getting in the truck. So by almost, for, I think he intended to find both, and I think that it is, it is impossible in some way factually that he didn't find both but I think he also intended legally to find both. Would you talk a little bit about the youthful offender statute and whether you think inflict means causation or whether you think it means something else? Well, first, I mean, I would say that the language of the statute is um, that the offense involves the infliction. It does not actually say that the defendant is doing the infliction. Um, I, my recollection of the previous argument is that Justice Cordy asked a number of questions to the effect of, isn't death always involved the infliction of serious bodily harm? Um, and again, as I said, the, the issue was fully litigated. It had amicus submissions. It was fully litigated at the first trial. This court said the um, crime of involuntary manslaughter inherently involves the infliction of serious bodily harm. Um, and not just in a footnote, said it in the body of the text um, and did not suggest, you know, in these circumstances it did or it could, that it always does, which is certainly if you interpret, you know, she induced him to inflict serious bodily harm on himself. Um, and again, I, as I noted in my brief, the legislature has amended the statute since then and has not revised the language, which under the canons of statutory interpretation suggests that it has accepted this court's reading in Carter I, even if it's not a, you know, exhaustive discussion of what inflict means that this particular aspect of it has been interpreted. Can, can, I ask, go ahead. Can, can I ask you to address the amicus argument about the statute um, and how we're not going to convict somebody of this who's counseling their mother or father who you know, has pancreatic cancer and is dying and uh, you start suggesting, well, maybe they take too many of these pills. It, it, how are we going to ensure that that's not the same wanton and reckless conduct? Well, I think that, um, well, first of all, I mean, there's not. I'm not saying that's yeah. good or bad. I'm just saying that, yes, is, I mean, that, is that, in your view, meet the definition of, that we've defined here or not? And how, and how has it not met that definition? 
Well, I think that, first of all, involuntary manslaughter has a very tightly knit set of requirements that you have, you have to have wanton and reckless conduct, which again is significantly higher than, um, than negligence, than gross negligence. You can't have a common law crime on less. Um, somebody actually has to die, which there's plenty of wanton and reckless conduct that doesn't kill anybody out of luck. And there has to be a but for cause, not just a sort oh, of. Oh, but know, I'm, I'm positing yeah. that, that you've got someone deathly ill in terrible pain, mm -hmm. um, and their family member, for whatever reason, is. And they're, they're talking about suicide, and, they're, they're, and their family member is engaging in that discussion in, in, a, in a way that they know could lead to the person actually acting on it. So is, is that not covered by this, or is it potentially covered? I just want to try to understand your view of that and why not. Well, I think that in a number of homicide scenarios, you could have the desire to help put a family member out of their pain that would not negate the otherwise intent. I mean, if if it rose to the level of intent necessary for murder, there's, I, I don't think that's debated. But we're talking about involuntary no, manslaughter. we are, sure. but okay. I'm just saying there, there's not really a sort of compassionate exception for most criminal but, laws but, in terms but, of the causation. I, I, I'm just asking, is this, is your view, is that the same as this? Well, I, I think that by saying in Carter one that it's not the same, this court has narrowed the scope of the available. And is, is that, so we emphasize the coercion element. Mm -hmm. Is that is that your understanding? The I think that, it's that. And and how do you interpret coercion in that context? I think as I said in Carter one, I think it would really sort of be who's driving at that at the moment of essential at whatever the critical moment is. That you know, are you assisting well, I mean, this if, person? If I'm they want? if you're counseling your terribly ill elderly parent who's dependent on you, or you, I take it you're in the driver's seat a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Um, so um, is, that the, is that the issue? I mean, I think that scenario, while much more sympathetic, might be a problem. I mean, I don't know that um, when you're deciding life or death is issues for somebody without, in a context where you have the greater power, that that is something that the law could justly be troubled by and that could be, I mean, again, a, a jury, a judge might feel incredibly sympathetic, but that that would not change the general fact that this is not conduct that we want to give general license to that results in well, essentially a, a homicide. There's a difference between general license to and convicting you of a crime, right? And there's a difference between something we're licensing mm -hmm. and, and something oh, we're yes. prosecuting, no, but, right? But I mean, I think that to say that, you know, involuntary manslaughter prohibits somebody from making, for ultimately making the decision of whether somebody else should live or die is not, you know, a parade of horribles in the sort of most of the sense that, um, that I mean, there's, there's all sorts of important discussion there, but that that does not. Um, now, I, I know this is, is a different kind of fact situation than what we've got presented, but in the, in the states where there are statutes hmm? regarding assisted suicide, do you know which direction they tend to run? Do they tend to run to permit it, or do they tend to run to prohibit it? My understanding from the defense brief is they tend to run to prohibit it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and... Well, yes. let, me, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. uh, would the evidence be sufficient if we did not have her text saying I told he got scared and he left the car and I told him to get back in? It would certainly be much, much closer and poss quite possibly not sufficient. I think that because of or the... Quite possibly... Not sufficient because of the causation issue that the judge identified that, you know, you could imagine other circumstances if he had killed himself at other junctures, other things might have been enough, but that... Um, in that particular context, notwithstanding the um, foreign voluntary manslaughter. I mean, there is, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of evidence that she expected him to die at that point. But, um, but in terms of, you know, being the but-for cause, again, involuntary manslaughter being a very sort of tight nexus of facts. More than but-for cause. I mean, in yeah. Justice Kafka's example, the for an elderly parent who may not have mm -hmm. access to sleeping pills, handing them sleeping yes. pills may make you a but for cause. But uh, are you saying that that is sufficient for somebody who wants to go, uh, to give them the means to go? Or are you saying that you must overwhelm, you must also overcome their desire to live or their renewed desire to live, as well as providing them as well as pushing them essentially to do something that they've decided they no longer want to do. Well, I, I think in line with 
Carter one, it would certainly require um, that um, that there be coercion. Um, but I think that um, I mean this this case is in the unusual circumstance of being at sort of a again a, cro a cultural crossroads of there's discussions of you know is suicide ever appropriate under any circumstances. I think in Massachusetts, as far as I'm aware it was last sort of stated in case law as being unlawful but unprosecutable. So, um, I mean, you know. as basis for the unlawfulness of suicide? Um, this court, I, I believe it's the compelling state interest. I think it was put by this court back in the late 70s in the um, removal of nutrition cases and right not to treat as um, an interest in the prevention of irrational self-destruction. And now arguably we're in a, debate over whether there is another category of rational self-destruction and whether that should be treated differently. But um, so it's not grounded in religious arguments. Um, there may, it may have been originally, but I think that the recent case law has not, um, okay. has not, got, I mean, so I think there were some dissents in one of the cases that did, but I think it was also based on broader ideas. But again, I think that um, this particular, cases that are, Insofar as that debate does break down into, you know, is this a situation where somebody, where the person dying is able to make a sort of informed rational decision or not, that we don't need to decide all of the cases about um, the potentially, is the potentially rational circumstances to get at cases where the um, defendant or where the victim or the person dying is not, I mean, you know, Conrad Roy, in addition to all his vulnerabilities, um, told, said himself, even when he was feeling awful, you know, I was fine two months ago, but I'll never get better. Um, she knew he got better. She was worried he was going to forget about her when he got better. She had previously told him that she couldn't believe she'd been here there for him for all of his past episode, and then he didn't date her afterwards. Um, and by the time he died, she had told her friends that he was already missing with the generator, and she was talking to his parents, and what would she do? She was supposed to keep him alive. It's all her fault. She was dying, and he was dying, and she was texting him at the same time about how to fix the generator, go to Sears, go to another Sears, you know. That essentially is like, well, I tried it. It didn't work, and she, like, I guess I'll give up, and she kept being sort of the rational advisor there, and I think there is some evidence. There are other times she told her friends things that were not true where she intended them to become true by the time they found out whether or not they were true. Um, she told Samantha Boardman she was going to McLean, and Samantha didn't believe her. And she said, then she told her mother, I want to go to McLean, and arranged for it to happen. And then she told Samantha, see, I told you I wasn't lying two days later. So I think it's, it's safe to say that by the time that she told her friends that he was missing and presumed suicidal, that she expected that but, but now, now you've confused me, because right. if, you, if you clear the debris from this case, I guess the ultimate question is whether or not this is an assisting suicide, which may or may not be sufficient as wanton or reckless voluntary mm -hmm. manslaughter, or whether this is essentially a coercion mm -hmm. of suicide for somebody who yeah. has decided that he no longer wants to do it. Uh, is it your view that assisting suicide is voluntary manslaughter, or must it reach the level of mm -hmm. coercing a suicide for somebody who has changed their mind? I think that certainly, I think there was coercion in this case. I think that probably the safer course from the purpose of First Amendment and other considerations is to narrowly tailor to that fact pattern. I don't know that the general elements of involuntary manslaughter would inherently prohibit it, but again, I don't know that, um, I, that's still very ta narrow, narrowly tailored to foreseeability in a particular context. So I think Carter One took this case out of the, um, the scope of everything that involuntary manslaughter could mean, and I think it's reasonable to leave it there hey, and I, reach other cases on other days. Can I ask you about the causation issue uh, on sufficiency? On, on the neglect of duty theory, when you look at Levesque, it was expert testimony that the delay in reporting the fire increased the severity of the risk. Mm -hmm. um, that was from a, a fire investigator. Here, we don't have that testimony. Um, the Commonwealth, in a light most favorable, would say that she put him in the vehicle, she knew of the danger, and she knew it was a particular parking lot through the text message, if, if, we, if we get there. Um, shouldn't you have put in evidence about what would have happened had she called 911 
and we're left to speculate and there's a failure proof by your failure not to present that evidence at trial? It, I mean, I think that that certainly would have been helpful. Um, I think that while both, while both theories were open, I think the judge was particularly interested in the Levesque theory, but um, yes, I think that certainly would have you've, been. You've told us that we, we should yeah. use both theories, so yes. we have to look no, at it. No, they, okay, they were so, both available. So why, when we look at Levesque and we, we have that testimony, and here you didn't present mm -hmm. that to a judge, you're basically asking us just to draw an inference when one calls 911, <laughs> Mm -hmm. the, there's going to be a response that's going to be saved, but we don't have no testimony about what would have happened, what the mm -hmm. response time was, what her medical condition would have been. Well, again, I, I, <coughs> I mean, I think it's possible that a court could draw inferences that a fire gets worse over time without expert testimony. Expert testimony would always be helpful in that regard. I think that carbon monoxide, as like fires actually, is something that people are sort of trained in in home safety. If you have a carbon monoxide detector, you know, it lets you know that <coughs> you should get out. And that the theory that, you know, you don't drop dead as soon as you breathe it. But, which, but counsel, isn't the point of the evidence that um, whether, whether that would have, whatever would have happened, whether he would have lived, yeah. he might have lived, it could have helped, we don't know, would almost be irrelevant because the point is going, that piece of evidence is going to her intent or to her. Mm -hmm. so, so does it matter whether we, we know what actually would have happened? I mean, I, I believe in Pew it was required to show beyond a reasonable doubt that it would have helped had she taken evidence to, um, to save the child at that point or taken action. So I think in that sense, it would matter. I mean, again, there's also the telling him to get out of the truck. Um, she had threatened him that day with, you know, I'm going to get you help if you don't do it today. Um, she knew he was terrified of ending up in the hospital, of disappointing his family. He was he expressed more worry about failing at a suicide attempt than he did at succeeding at one. That he said, I, I can only do it if it's going to work. So I think she would have known she had significant leverage over him that if she had threatened to pull the plug on the attempt that, if nothing else, would have gotten him out of the truck. Did the Commonwealth argue the failure to warn theory in this closing argument? I don't recall, Your Honor. Sorry. When we look at the statute, I mean, when we look at the issue of assisted suicide versus coercing, do, is this an applied analysis or, you know, it's a First Amendment analysis, right? Mm -hmm. you know, and the distinction that the Chief Justice just pointed out between coercing someone and coercing someone who has already changed their mind about mm -hmm. doing it. That, that may fit the facts here. Do we do this as applied the constitutional analysis or do we have to take into account that a um, fact finder might not recognize that distinction? I, I think that in this case, I mean, again, there, there has to be, I think, I mean, if sufficiency requires that degree of causation, then... I, I get the sufficiency issue. I'm more yeah. worried about the over-inclusiveness mm -hmm. possibility. Well, if the sufficiency requires coercion, right. and you can't find sufficiency without it, then you can't find... The chief has just added another wrinkle. Mm -hmm. you know, you're not just coercing sort of a vulnerable person who's going back and yeah. forth. You're coercing someone who's changed their mind, yes. which may be very directly on point here, but is there still a danger that that there's a problem with wanton and reckless application in this situation? Well, I think that the scope of, I mean, I found relative lack of cases applying the First Amendment directly to common law crimes, and I didn't see many cited in other sources either, but I think that by nature, the scope of this particular crime will be whatever this court says it is, and if the court is worried it is too broad, the court can narrow it. Right. Um, I mean, so it can, all, it can, we it also can have to do decide this in, in favor only of a set of crimes that would certainly survive First Amendment analysis. We also have to do it in the context of this limited factual discussion that we've got before us, right? I'm sorry. We, we have to do this in the yes. context of a limited yes. factual finding with this generality overlay to it, to that it, it may not be everything I found, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think I get it. So I would, I would say that you know this court had the coercion requirement in Carter one. There's the Commonwealth sees no reason to broaden it, whether or not this court could, and that that, that would be sufficient. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor.